uh, how we can incorporate population data and other non-routine data into the uh, DHIS2. Uh, so this is uh, just a short 15-minute uh, presentation, but it's a quite important topic because basically all your other analytics more or less relies on getting this right. So much of the analysis we're doing is based on having good denominator data. So this is sort of a small but critical uh, element. So the goal is to talk a bit about why this non-routine data is important to include in the HIS2. Uh, a bit about how um, we can work with the non-routine and that together and how this can be set up uh, in the best way in the HIS2. Uh, so, just a quick background first, why is it uh, useful to have the non-routine data? I think uh, Victoria already talked a bit about the uh, data triangulation this morning. Um, so, looking at multiple data sources. One uh, way of doing that is bringing in the non-routine uh, data sources and looking at it together with the routine data for triangulation. It could be looking at your immunization coverage from the routine data with the uh, immunization coverage from household service, for example. Uh, also, you can bring in um, non-survey data, like data from campaigns, which is typically handled outside of the routine system, but you can bring in the results to be able to do analytics. So we'll see an example of a vaccination campaign dashboard uh, later. So if we think of the typical um, health indicator that is monitored routinely. I would say most of them are based on having some sort of population, often population, but at least having some sort of denominator that is not collected routinely. Uh, so if we think, for example, of immunization, we have the coverage indicators using the population data as denominator. We have the uh, maternal health looking at antenatal care coverage using the expected pregnancies as the denominator. For malaria, you might be looking at the annual blood examination rate with a population at risk as your denominator. So there are all these core indicators from different health areas that rely on having good non-routine denominator data available. So just an example on the right here, we have BCG coverage indicator. Your service data, it could be coming from a case-based system. It could be coming from your monthly immunization reports. But in any case, you need to have the under one population as uh, available in DHIS2 to be able to, to produce the coverage indicators. Uh, if you look at this, I don't know if any of you have seen this global reference list of health indicators from WHO. Um, so what the WHO and partners has sort of identified as the 100 most important health indicators. Uh, including the SDGs that are health related. Uh, very small subset of those are actually um, from routine systems. A lot of it is only available through service. So if I want to use DHIS2 as a analysis platform where you have all your key health indicators, you will need to bring in not only the denominator data, but also survey results. Another example here, uh, if you think of data quality, uh, one way to assess your data quality is to do triangulation. So in this case, this is from the WHO data quality review framework, um, which includes an element where you look at your coverage indicators based on uh, routine reporting versus coverage indicators from household surveys. Uh, so, Let's look a bit on how this could be done in DHS. Uh, so what we generally recommend when it comes to population data and denominators is that in DHS2, you have one data set which uh, is used across all the health services. So getting all the health programs departments to agree on one set of core population indicators. Um, this is often like the core indicator uh, population data set is often based on census data uh, that is then used with some projections to get estimates 
uh, between the censuses. Uh, so having that as a common data set in DHIS2 is uh, for the recommended approach. Um, then there are some specificities here. Uh, for example, if you're doing then, if you have a new census, there are new projections. Uh, you need to make sure you not only include the future projections, but also ideally update historical data with the updated projections so that you get, uh, you're able to do proper year over year trends uh, of the population based indicators. In addition to having this sort of core population data set, uh, um, it is possible uh, and useful in many cases to include sort of alternative denominators. So in some cases, different health programs will have, um, will want to have sort of special in population denominators. Um, it could be, for example, that you would want uh, population estimates based on survey service data. That's sort of one approach. Um, it's important then to differentiate these sort of other population estimates from your core population data set. Uh, in countries where you have strong uh, civil registration systems, uh, perhaps you would want to have the census population estimates, but you would also, for example, want to bring in your um, uh, numbers from birth registrations. So you have an additional uh, denominator available for um, live births from the CRVS. So I think uh, the third thing here, which I'll go a bit more in, uh, into detail on, is pulling in population estimates from other sources. So that's something there's been a lot of work in the uh, DHIS platform itself over the last few years on making it easier to use alternative population sources and bringing those directly into um, DHIS2 for analysis. So these are just a few examples from uh, the DHIS2 map application, uh, which I think is part of DHIS2 that is often very sort of underutilized, underestimated. Uh, but the map application of DHIS2 has actually uh, become a very powerful uh, GIS tool. Uh, and among the relatively new features here now is that you're able to pull in from um, different global population estimate sources into the MAPS application, uh, alternative population estimates. Um, so for example, there is this uh, initiative called GRID3. Uh, there is the World Population um, Project that provides uh, population estimates. You can visualize those in uh, the MAPS application of DHIS2. And with the latest version of DHIS2, you can also actually import those population estimates as a data set in DHIS2 and use them in indicator calculations, et cetera. Uh, another relatively new feature is that you can actually bring in from uh, Google Earth Engine uh, structures from satellite maps. So you, the individual houses uh, from satellite images and display them on uh, within the maps application of DHIS2. So if you're sort of going in depth on trying to look at your um, uh, your indicators uh, sort of geographically, you can zoom in and look at where you actually have the clusters of households related to the health facilities um, uh, and the indicator data for those health facilities. Uh, there is also an application that lets you calculate catchment areas for health facilities. Uh, so using uh, this called the Crosscut is a is a company that has developed this. It is becoming available also within DHIS2. Um, so based on geographical data um, about the health facilities, location of the health facilities. It's looking at things like travel time for the population to get to the nearest health facility, uh, the terrain, uh, et cetera. So using the geographical features to actually draw up catchment boundaries around the health facilities. 
So you start with the location of the health facility. The system will you look at the geography, the roads and everything, and it will figure out the, the sort of the boundaries, what locations, uh, what households will have this health facility as the as their uh, nearest health facility. I think we've already talked a bit about this organic profile. There's also a, a new feature within the maps application that lets you visualize information about the health facilities. Uh, there are also some uh, new features. Um, New features coming in the, I think in the next one or two releases. Uh, so one is to be able to identify settlements. So not just the structures, but sort of clusters of structures. Um, and look again at the travel time from these settlements to the various health facilities that you have uh, geographical coordinates for. Uh, looking at the travel time, uh based on the facility catchments so from health facility what is the travel time in different directions uh, enable to enabling you to visualize that and the last one is uh, allowing printing of maps from the maps application to use for example if you're doing campaign planning and you prefer to have paper tools uh, for doing that so that was a bit around the population and the different uh, ways that is integrated in maps in particular. Uh, I think, as I mentioned initially, a uh, big part of sort of the core health indicators uh, is based on survey data, household surveys. Uh, and the aggregate model of DHIS2 is quite well suitable for storing that information. So not actually doing the household surveys with DHIS2, but once you have the results to bring those into DHIS2, uh, enabling you to do analysis, to do triangulation with the routine data, etc. Um, there are often some things when you're actually going into DHIS2 to, to set this up, some things that you need to keep in mind. One thing is, of course, that the survey data is perhaps available with uh, every three years, every five years. Um, so the way you set up the data elements, the indicators, needs to take into account uh, or what periods you want this survey data to be available for when you're doing analysis in DHIS2. Uh, another issue is that the household surveys sometimes are not done and aggregated based on the same administrative hierarchy as you would have in DHIS2. Um, because of the way the households are sampled, etc., you might not have the regions, the, the districts that you have in DHIS2. Uh, for the survey results. That was the population and survey. Then uh, I think a, a third sort of major area uh, where it's useful to bring in um, non-routine data into DHIS2 is around campaigns and other sort of non-routine non interventions uh, like active case detection for malaria, etc. Uh, so if you use the campaigns as an example, uh, you can bring in your campaign data if you have uh, immunization campaigns uh, to address immunization gaps. You can bring it into DHIS2 and then, then you can do triangulation with campaign data and the routine data on immunization, for example. So there are some sort of best practices you need to keep in mind. For example, not adding up the routine and the campaigns, because then you sort of lose track of, uh, you're not able to follow the trends in the routine immunization, et cetera, if you just lump them together. Um, so keeping the underlying data separate, but then you can use indicators within DHIS2 for the cases where you want to actually look at the, the combination of the campaign and the routine data. Similarly, if, if you're collecting routinely uh, malaria case data, and you're also doing active case surveillance for malaria, keeping those separate so you, you're not sort of conflating um, data collecting through different means. So I think uh, at this point, I will ask uh, Vito to just give a quick example of 
what a uh, campaign type dashboard can look like in uh, DJs? Yes, super quickly. Um, this is actually a real example. These are retrospective data, but nonetheless, um, a real example from a, a meningitis campaign that happened in, uh, in Niger. And this is what they ended up visualizing for like because they started bringing in all the retrospective data for the um, for um, all the campaigns that have done it for those who are not aware niger belongs to one of those countries is one of those countries that belong to the what it's called the meningitis belt so they have like every year they have recurrent outbreaks of meningitis and therefore um, meningitis campaigns are pretty much almost <laughs> routine there, but nonetheless, they are campaigns that can happen either at national level or at local level. This one was a, a national campaign, and uh, we just wanted to highlight how important it is to bring all these kind of um, sources of information together. Why? Because uh, you can start triangulating the campaign data and the campaign results together with uh, you might know, for example, that when you have uh, either um, immunization campaigns or it could be uh, a bed net campaign or it could be a mass drug distribution campaign, you might want to do surveys for coverage afterwards. And when you do coverage for um, coverage, you can start triangulating those results with your routine coverage as well or update your, your coverage until that was there until that moment with the new coverage that you have achieved during the campaign. And just we just wanted to like show you, for example, the overall coverage you see here. Normally, when you think of a coverage, it shouldn't go above the 100%. But here we went 105%. So why that could be? It's because of the denominators at the end of the day. And once you start checking, uh, the, the curves of distribution. Here we have, uh, for example, the doses by, by the type of site, by the group age groups and such. Here you have a map of the different coverages by the different districts as well. And you see that the majority of the districts in the end are in orange, which means that they have a coverage that is above 100%. And that can happen with like, here is an example of immunization campaign, but it can happen with any type of campaign. And you see, for example, here, once you start disaggregating, disaggregating by age, you start seeing, for example, that the main problem here was that the age group between one and five years, they were more than they were expected. And, uh, and these are the kind of information that when you bring in in your, in, in your routine information system and you're in general, you start triangulating with your routine data, this is the most important in kind of information that you can triangulate. Why? Because now you have found out that in these areas where the coverage is more than 100%, you chances are your, your children below five that you have quite a lot of children that were not registered in the national system, for example. So this was just like a, a quick example, just to give you an idea of what kind of information you can triangulate, but most importantly, what kind of information you can extrapolate when you start triangulating, when you start adding things together. So I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Vito. Uh, so that was actually the end of this short session. Uh, we are already a bit over time, but if there are some burning questions specifically to the issue of population and um, non-routine data in DHS2, yep. Uh, thank you for the, the presentation, uh, Olaf. Just a question from previous uh, session. Uh, for the death, uh, if the uh, case uh, registered as a death and we have uh, one unified uh, instance for all cases on unique identifier. So can we block the TI from the system to notify the user that this case uh, or this uh, patient uh, uh, is uh, died just to avoid the wrong data entry while they're entering? So... So we need to keep it inside the system, yeah, for, but uh, notify if, if if it happens by... It's maybe, um, 
something uh... can we do it in a rule program rule yeah that's why i can't answer from the top of my head whether <clears throat> i'm not sure actually so that's something we can uh, look at because okay. I agree that's an important point because you need to keep the <laughs> keep the enrollment and all the data there, but you don't want additional data. Okay, so we'll test it. It's not related to your session, but in general, will be in this workshop a walk through actual work, uh, walk through through the system is not just only presentation or actual exercises where we enter data and use the system. Because information like this is in the presentation, though it's comprehensive, but unless we practice it or see it, it's not going to stick. That's it. Yeah, so we had a very brief uh, session yesterday. Uh, I think I'm looking at you, Rajit. We have an ex exercise uh, later today, but I'm not 100% sure how much that will be in the chat. I think. We'll be using the DHS dashboards at least to do some analysis uh, there. Yeah, but in general, this is not the sort of DHS2 <laughs> training, so uh, it's limited what we'll actually be doing in DHS2. If there are no final questions, I guess uh, I'll leave the floor to Vito again. <laughs> 